there and not talking with few people. Uh, the fact is that uh, I'm in David Perez Garcia's group and uh, I'm a physicist. I, I did my thesis in quantum information and uh, which, which in principle it's a, it's a topic that is a bit uh, separated from causality. But the fact is that uh, during the time that lasted, uh, that my PhD lasted, there started appearing a couple of tools uh, with the aim of characterizing what well, I'll, I'll explain now a little bit more in detail with characters in some quantum phenomena. And uh, we started seeing some connections that could be uh, exploitable or applicable when trying to uh, study a causal inference and doing causal analysis. So the idea that I have is that I'm going to try to explain you these tools, how they work more or less. And my goal is try to actually try to actually see if they have something real to do with, with causal inference and causal analysis. So as, uh, as Roy said, uh, please interrupt me at any point. I've reduced the quantum stuff at the minimum. Uh, hopefully it will appear one or once or twice. <laughs> And uh, yeah, if there's any any doubts about notation, about terminology, let's like please don't hesitate in interrupting because uh, my goal, and I guess that you like I hope that after the talk yours as well, is to really understand how these uh, techniques can can be used in causal inference. Okay. So, the, so what I'm going to start with is uh, the quantum part. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about a result in quantum mechanics. Well, that exactly. So it's a result that is not strictly quantum, but it's all used a lot in quantum information. That is Bell's theorem. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to start um, uh, by um, presenting what what is the what is uh, this about? It's essentially. Uh, trying to characterize or trying to analyze which which um, observations can you see in a specific physical scenario. So imagine that I have two parties uh, that are called Alice. And um, is the is um, the size good? Uh, people in the in the um, in the screen may say, okay, I'll, I'll make it a bit bigger. Okay, so we have two parties, Alice and Bob, that share. Uh, that each has a share of uh, some some physical state. So, so some physical system, it's a break party system, and uh, each of these parties has one, one of the shares. And then each of the parties can perform some measurements, so can, can observe this uh, physical system, and they can do several observations, which in the case for Alice are denoted by X. So in the... Um, in the other, in the rest of the lectures, notation like numbering of uh, well cardinalities started from from one, if I'm not mistaken. If it's not too bad, I want to use I want to start with zero because it's easier for writing some equations. But it's it's I mean, there's nothing deep in there. Okay, so let's take the simplest scenario in which Alice can do one of two measurements. Okay, let's put. Maybe let's put a like a real example. Say that this physical system is a card of a deck. Okay. And the measures that Alice and Bob are gonna are gonna do. Uh, now we have y it's also gonna be either zero or one. The measures are either um, the color, if it's red or black, or other than or the the number. If it's greater than seven or lower than seven, for example, you see that, that I did I I used binary binary outcomes for these measurements because in the simplest scenario, uh, each measurement um, generates an outcome that we are also going to consider to be um, binary. Okay, so I'd explain both. Yes, both persons uh, are. Uh, Measuring both things, or yeah. So we are going to be playing this for a number of rounds, and at each round, each person can independently choose whether they measure um, color, the color or the number. Okay. 
And after running a number, like a number of rounds, they will get a probability distribution of, out, okay, let's use, um, here's where my clashes with standard probability notation, uh, like, right? So we've been using these probabilities of A, B, so probabilities of outcomes, given some choices of inputs. After many rounds, they will be able to, to estimate this object. And a question that is um, quite uh, interesting in quantum mechanics, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why, is uh, trying to characterize which kinds of distributions you can observe in these sort of experiments or not. So for doing this, uh, people have resorted to trying to model this uh, phenomenon uh, like in, in terms of causal graphs. That is why I think this is a this is a good time after a couple of lectures in cause in causal graphs. This is a good time to start the discussing about this these tools. So what would we have in this experiment if we thought of it causally? So uh, in principle, we have two variables, two random variables, A and B. Uh, I'm going to use zero codes for these, and and uh, the justification will be will come in a second. We have these two variables, A and B. And now we know that the value of A can be influenced by the choice of, of input, by the value of this random variable X, okay? So we're gonna have something like this and the same for Y. And also the values for A and B are going to depend on the value of this variable over here or, or on which card they were, they were measuring essentially. So this, let me call it lambda, just for, for, for tradition. And this, I'm going to use a square instead of, a, instead of a circle, because in principle, this variable is not observed until the only information that we have about this variable is through the measurements that Alice and Bob make, okay? But now we have one of these causal graphs that we were we were seeing in the other in the previous lectures, and uh, we can we can, for example, uh, use the Markov condition to um, determine which probabilities we can observe. Yes, uh, yeah, just to clarify for the implementation. So x is a variable that can take two values. Correct. Refer to whether I measure color or number. Yes, and a is a realization of whatever I measure. So. Uh, Yes, indeed. indeed. So if I measure color, it can be red or black. Yes, okay. exactly. And if it's color, it's red and black. And if it's a number, it's above seven or below seven or, or mm -hmm. whatever. But uh, if you do seven, then it's like 50%. And, and certain, X is chosen each time by Alice and Y is chosen by Bob. By yes. Bob. Yes. So, we, so, so the next purpose, I mean, do, do they want to cheat the other or? Um, Are they dreadful persons or what? No, no. Um, we may come back to that in a, in a second if, if, uh, if the question is, is still relevant. Because if you go to, like, if you, okay, I'll tell you later. <laughs> can, yes. I, can I go back to your question? So yes. X is whether Alex decides to measure color or number. Yes. A is the output of that measurement? A is the result of that measurement. So, so that measure could be red, not red, mm -hmm. and that measure could be less than or greater or equal yes. to seven. Correct. So it's so it's it's sort of a so this is like a funny weird random variable which is defined as zero one, but like in different domains. So it, uh, yes, or you can you can think of it. It's just condition yeah, so, X has four values. Right. I mean, condition X, two values have probably yeah, yes. values. You, you can think of you can think of this. I mean, if you if you, you can think of this, yes, as uh, uh, not being say one bit or but two bits. So one bit is going to determine the color, and well, yeah. the other bit is going to determine the, um, <laughs> the number. And yeah, depending but, on the on the on the choice of X. You're going to choose one or the other. But you only observe one of the features. You only observe one of the features at each round. Yes. Okay. And but there is a true underlying value for the distribution of color. 
Yes. And the distribution of number, right? Yes. So it's true. So it's, it's like the, the cat is certainly dead or alive or whatever. Yes. We are yes. doing weird things. <laughs> you, no, no, not okay. yet. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. okay. Yes. Okay. That, that's perfect. Yes, okay. indeed. Not, nothing weird so far. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and because nothing is weird so far, then yes. Yeah. I, yeah. Maybe uh, with the example of coloring number, you see that's uh, two different domains. But uh, physically, you can yes. put something that uh, you end up measuring the same, but you put something in between that it's kind of choosing the measurement. So there is some physical experiment where you can put a, a mirror that uh, allows you to do one measure or the other if you put a mirror or not. So although he's explaining it with two different domains yes but know, yeah in the end you could you could consider it as as the same domain it, it is yes, like I mean, two this... ways of, of measuring black and not black or something like that so even if, if yes uh, yeah okay well yes yes but i mean here like what i'm gonna say so far like the reasoning now is all purely classical Nothing funny, I'm not trying to hide you anything. <laughs> but but thanks for the questions. Uh, okay, so now we have uh, this causal graph over here and we can wonder, okay, now we take this probability distribution of um, like A, B, X, Y or A, B, X, Y, Lambda. And using the Markov condition, we can say that this, like distributions that are compatible with this causal graph, factorize as probability of x, probability of y, and then the probability of, uh, I'm using, yeah, I'm mixing capitals and non capitals. x, y, lambda, and then um the probability of a given x and lambda and the probability of b given y and lambda right and uh now that we have this expression here uh first we note that uh well yes now that, that we have with this expression here we can compute this conditional distribution, and this will just be um, the sum over all possible values of lambda of probability of lambda, probability of A given X lambda, and probability of B given Y lambda. Okay. Uh, so far, so good. I mean, again, nothing, nothing quantum here, nothing funny here. Um, so far, we're we're trying to see this experiment in terms of a of a causal of a, of a causal scenario. Well, it turns out that um, the distributions that have this form are kind of easy to to characterize in the sense that you can give an alternative characterization or, or an alternative expression for this, that uh, it's, it's simple to see that it's a polytope. It's a polytope, so um, this means that uh, distributions that admit this form are like a, like a big um, polygon in, in, in high dimensions. And in particular, there's um, flat faces, like, like it has flat faces. And uh, well, one of these flat faces is the following. So I'm going to write it here. This is what I want it to be visible. So I'm going to keep it here. So we have that. Uh, so it's this face over here. I'm going to introduce in this notation now. Uh, 0, 1 plus E10 plus E11 minus E11. This has to be smaller than or equal than two, where this e x y is the sum over a and b of minus one to the a plus b plus 
x dot y with the associated probability. Okay, this is one of the phases, and this is this is known that it's tight. It's a it's a tight phase, and it characterizes this this uh, so any distribution that admits this form so that is compatible with this causal graph satisfies this equation. Now here's the quantum thing. If and and why this this formalism is important for for people that study quantum mechanics and quantum information. This is Bell's theorem. The, yes, this is Bell's theorem, which, in 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 terms of like causality, it's not that a big thing, right? I mean, it's just simple analysis. Where, where is where is the the interesting thing? When so here, if we consider a classical variable, we have here we have this. But if in this experiment, we use here a quantum system. And these parties perform different measurements on this quantum system that have uh, this binary, I mean, that can get two outcomes. You compute this thing and you can get a value higher than two. And that's it. I mean, it's, it's something like super uh, stupid, but if you, if you think of the very simple analysis that we've done, I mean, what can go wrong in here, right? Well. This is the motivation for, for like a lot of things in quantum information and in quantum information theory that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> but uh, here I just I just wanted to give you a, like a, a, a short overview to why like these things are important and especially to the, to the causal analysis of, of experiments in quantum information. Because yes, I mean people have been dealing with this these inequalities and trying to to identify which equivalent inequalities um, characterize your quantum correlations, or how can you understand these violations in terms of, a, of a, you know, an, an acceptable model of the world and stuff like this. But um, I'm not going to enter into all that. I'm going to enter into generalizations of the use of this causal analysis. Because, um, well, here we have a very simple scenario, which is just two parties. But um, now that, uh, well, also experiments are, are getting ready, uh, one can consider what happens when you have more parties in your setup and try to characterize also these distributions that, uh, mm, well, yeah, try to characterize what, which distributions can be generated. And well, over there, we do it with the motivation of finding uh, examples in quantum mechanics that do not follow those models. But uh, this is a general, I mean, this is a general question that can be uh, interesting in the analysis of correlations that are generated in causal models. Okay. Is this a, a simple way to say that there aren't any hidden variables in quantum mechanics? Because the, I mean, this gamma is sort of a hidden variable. Uh, you are basically arguing that since it doesn't fulfill the Bell's equation, it's an illustration that you don't have hidden variables. Well, there there are a few ways. Yes, there are indeed a few ways of uh, getting this number, like getting um, uh, evaluations that are above two. One of them actually connects with what David said earlier. If these choices are not independent, so if there is like a hidden variable that determines also the choice of inputs, then you can get above two. But in terms of, of, of causal analysis, then this makes a lot of sense because now you're evaluating an inequality that need not to hold in your new causal diagrams. Uh, another way would be, for example, that um, the input of one of the parties is sent to the other parties. Well, there are a number of, of them. And uh, actually, like it's it's a big topic what this violation means if you want to keep the causal diagram. Because what you have in quantum mechanics, I mean, what, what is the accepted solution is not that um, there doesn't exist uh, hidden variables, but that uh, these, well, th this, because you can only access, um, 
because you can only gain information about your system by measuring it, uh, the state before the measurement, the state of your system before the measurement is not completely defined. I mean, it's it's a, it's a bit uh, it's a bit tricky, but uh, this is this is what uh, people typically typically accept that the only way of defining your system is through measurement. That before the measurement, it's not it's not well defined. Maybe in in terms of like causal language, let me see if if it's if this works a bit. When you have a classical variable, well, when you have like a latent variable, you could think of counterfactuals. You could say, okay, I know that my variable in this experiment had this value, and because of that, these are the things that I observed. But if it had had this other value, then it would have the result would have been this other. Well, this question is not that easy to, to do in quantum mechanics because these counterfactuals um, are, are not well defined. Well, the basic idea basically is that you have all possible, I mean, the, the very concept of counterfactual uh, does not exist. Exactly. Because basically you have all possible counterfactuals uh, working at the same time. I think that's the main difference. Yes, yes, but, yes. You could you could see it like that. I think so. Yes. Counterfactual means that you have an, um, an imaginary different trajectory. Yes. And the point with quantum mechanics is that actually you look up all those trajectories. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah. I think you could see it like that. I like I'm no expert in this like interpretations of uh, things, but I think that could be a good way of, of seeing it. So then the whole point of a causal framework or causal model. I mean, to explain things of quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. then in my opinion, makes no sense. Because you're basically destroying the, the very idea of a counterfactual. These imaginary worlds that, I mean, we, we discuss in causal, mm -hmm. causality, I mean, they do actually work in a funny way in quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. You have all possibilities, yes, right? Well. So you, you have the double speed experiment, you have, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, all the counterfactuals interacting. Yes. So, in that sense, uh, well, I, I, I I wouldn't dare to to say something like that. But because like my my knowledge in in this uh, <laughs> in this part is is limited. Uh, what I can say is that um, something that we can do and actually what we are doing in 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 these works, not only for for classical correlations that is what I will be focusing in this talk, but also for the correlations or the observations that you get when measuring quantum systems is that you, you can characterize uh, these this distributions of results uh, even if you have quantum systems but that uh, that you have, I mean, you, you don't have completely characterized. So if, that if you have a quantum system, then you can, if, if your parties are sharing quantum systems and measuring quantum systems, then there are ways of um, Putting limits or, or understanding which sorts of ob observations you can you can see in experiments, and there are like uh, both theoretical and, and numerical tools for for doing that. If you can give a causal interpretation to those um, to those uh, well to, to those experiments, that I don't know, <laughs> or I'm not completely sure. Yes, but. Uh... I, I I don't see why you cannot uh, talk about uh, counterfactuals here. Somehow, uh, if you if you use x equals zero, y equals zero, mm -hmm. you have decided to measure something, and you cannot observe what will happen with x equals one, y equals one, with the other possibilities. And this would be the counterfactuals somehow here. But because you cannot get the observation so, for those. So I, I think that the, the question goes more at the level of uh, this latent variable. So the, 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 the latent, the, in the case of the latent variable, you cannot say if my spin was in this direction or in this direction, because even if, you're, if, you, if your physical system has a particular state, I mean, you can define theoretically what is the state of a quantum system, but then this, 
yeah, I mean, this is this is a completely, <laughs> a, a completely different thing, but it like there are interpretations in which this the state of resistance, this wave function, is an is an is an epistemic uh, entity, and there are other some, um, there are some other interpretations where this uh, wave function is an ontic um, uh, entity. So, depending on on who you ask, uh, you may have uh, different, but uh, overall, all corresponding to experiments uh, explanations. But I mean, this this is a like a, a very big thing in in uh, in quantum information for sure. Um, okay, sh uh, so shall I continue? Um, all right. So, okay. Now that we've seen this, let me maybe change the blackboard because what I want to, what I came to talk about, is how we generalize. So how we analyze correlations. Okay. Okay. So you can see this this stuff about the theorem of finding what are the limits uh, that you can what are the limits on correlations that you can obtain using uh, classical latent variables or like standard latent variables <laughs> and try to uh, overpass those limits with quantum theory. Uh, this is what 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 people do uh, in this bipartite scenario. But, uh, well, now that we have a framework in terms of, uh, of causal, I mean, you can also wonder uh, what happens when you add more parties and are, add more variables. And for example, let, let, let me start with the simplest generalization to, it, to this, which is the case of three parties. And now we're gonna have a system here. Well, I'm going to omit um, inputs and outputs just for for the sake of uh, simplicity. But if it's if at some point it's not clear, just uh, just let me know. And uh, imagine that we have here another system. Now we have something like this. Okay. Imagine that this is our experiment now. This is actually something very also very popular in quantum information. This is called a quantum repeater. And typically, like I will, I will not enter into this, but typically, what the idea is that here you have an entangled quantum system, here you have an, another entangled quantum system, and then this part is doing some measurement or some operation in such a way that these parties that are uncorrelated initially, they end up sharing a quantum, uh, an entangled quantum system. Want I won't enter into this. What I care now about is, uh, well, how can I characterize now? the distributions of outcomes, A, B, C, given now X, Y, Z, that I observe, I can observe in this, in this scenario, okay? So if these two uh, elements, shall I? So there are now two latent variables. Instead. Now there's two latent variables, yes. I think I'm going to, to write the, the causal graph just uh, to, to keep the, the um, uh the parallelism so now we have we would have three uh, visible variables a b and c each one is affected by a particular input choice and now we would have that the value of a is determined or, or is influenced by this choice of input and also about uh, by one of these latent variables, and this latent variable is shared with Bob. And then, uh, but but now the value of Bob is also influenced by another latent variable, sigma, that is also shared with Charlie. Okay. <clears throat> oh. Yes. <laughs> the two latent variables are mm -hmm. properties of the same thing. Are they different properties of the same card, or are they like different cards altogether? Yes. Now they are going to be independent uh, variables, so it's going to be as if they were independent cards. Independent cards from independent decks. Okay. Okay. Thank like you. completely independent. Okay. Like if we if we see it in in terms of the causal diagram, there are no 
connections between the latent variables, which means that they are independent. I mean, actually, these two. Uh, uh, I want to say that they are deseparated, but I'm not sure because there's this B thing. So when conditioning on B, they are not independent. But uh, but if you like, in principle, yes. yes. Since there are no connections, mm -hmm. they are like the the joint distribution factorizes. And an interpretation now with the with the classical example of the cards gets trickier, right? Or it's not as direct. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, no, it's actually, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't think of. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can see it as random variables, but yes, yes, that example is not so. Yeah, exactly. No, not as to as the... Well, um. For example, okay, let's let's try to use cards. Let's say uh, Bob is going to receive, well, it's going it's going to choose either to measure the um, the um, color or the number, okay? But he's going to receive two cards, so he's going to measure individually, and then output the sum. So oh. if, if the parity, if they are the same or not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Why not? But the thing is that each of these. A, B, and C has to be a single measurement, like a single thing. Correct. Not a univariate thing, just to talk in the link. No, no, it's correct. It's, it's just a, a single thing. Yes. Okay, so it could be the sum or whatever combination of both Whatever, yeah. I, okay. Yeah, I mean, this, this. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And now, okay, okay so we have. question? Yes. Uh, what, why, I mean, why they choose for what risk to cheat to. Ah, okay. Uh, so yes. they want to cheat, or they uh, we are. Mm -hmm. um, I mean that is that is relevant uh, in in terms of like the, the, the quantum like quantum experiments, because um, going back to to this one, just for simplicity, uh, when you are sure that um, that you have a quantum system shared between the parties. Then you can do funny things. Then you have guarantees on the security of cryptographic protocols. For example, you have an advantages in, in communication complexity. Well, you have a, a number of advantages, but they crucially rely on the fact that you are able to guarantee that there's a quantum system over there. And a way of guaranteeing a quantum, that there is a quantum system, for example, by letting a bell inequality. But this inequality is like only guarantees you that there's something, a violation of this only guarantees you that there's something non-classical only if you have this causal scenario. If you have, like, I don't know, this connection that I just erased or some correlation between the inputs or whatever else, then you can violate this with a classical Latin variable. So it doesn't guarantee you a thing. That's why, um, uh, so and 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 people take this very seriously. Uh, there were these experiments in uh, uh, 2015, where in order to actually enforce this causal structure, they would separate these two parties by hundreds of meters. They would put them put the measurement devices in separate buildings, um, and they would do like super synchronized measurements in order to ensure completely that the causal structure is this and not that and, and not another one. So this is a, a very uh, um, at, at the level of experiments, having a guarantee on the causal structure is uh, is a very important thing. If they are cheating, well, I mean, the, the, so the approach that we have in the quantum information community is trying to avoid any possible way of cheating. Like, for example, doing this uh, large separations and stuff like that. Uh, another thing that you can do is Try to take into account possible cheating strategies, obtain bell like bell like inequalities in those scenarios, and try to violate those as well. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. So we're here, and we can we can apply again the Markov conditions, and then okay we have. This one, I let me write this one, and this is probably the last one that I will, I will write. We have the sum over lambda and mu over probability of lambda, probability of mu. 
probability of A given X and lambda, probability of B given Y lambda and mu, and the probability of C given uh, Z and mu. Okay. And um, so here we have that, uh, well, I told you, and, and you, I guess you believe me, that this sort of expression can be recast or recharacterized as a, as a, um, as a linear program. I did, I did say it, right? Maybe I didn't. So no, I said this, it's a polytope. So this is a polytope. And uh, characterizing polytopes can be done in terms of linear programs, uh, linear programming. So in the end, um, this, you can phrase it as some, uh, of some, some set of, in, of linear inequalities, so something of this form, of this form, okay? Uh, well, in this case, just this, linear inequalities. When you go to more general scenarios, when you go to the to the scenario over here, the fact that now you have two independent random variables, or this this part over here, means that uh, the characterization that you can get is not cannot be done in terms of a linear program any, anymore. The set of correlations that um, have, that admit this form is not a polytope, and this, in terms of numerical characterization. Is a big uh, is a bit of a of a of a problem. Nevertheless, you can still derive necessary conditions for for admitting a model like this. In particular, here in the in the causal scenario, you see it very easily. If you forget about b, if you marginalize over b, the the distribution of a and c must factorize, because once you marginalize over b, if you erase this node, there's no connection at all between anything that has to be that has to do with Charlie and anything that has to do with Alice. So still you can derive some necessary conditions. Uh, but then I'm going to make it a bit more difficult and say that I, that I add a new source over here. In this case, now we have another variable. Let me call it uh, mu. Uh, well, I Okay, this is a sigma. This is a sigma everywhere. Sorry for that. So if we add this other source, now the causal structure that we want to um, we want to characterize is something like this. And now, if if I if I trace out Bob, if I forget about Bob, there's still there's still some possible correlation. And there's, you don't even have factorizations to work into, to, to try to characterize this. So the problem becomes very, very hard. And you, you do have an analytic uh, expression for compatible correlations. But um, in terms of working with it numerically, it's very hard. So what I wanted to talk about <laughs> Is actually, yes. Yeah, one, one quick question. Yeah. In this characterization as a linear program, which mm -hmm. are the variables of the linear program, the set of distribution ah. on A and B? Right? Yes. Uh, okay, let me let me do it uh, quickly as, as an aside. Mm, yeah. So, for example, um, uh, what you can, so something that you can do is that if you assume that these I mean, in, in principle, these are these are stochastic functions. Mm -hmm. So for a given x and lambda, there's some probability of um, of um, getting some outcome a. Yeah. Turns out that all that all that stochasticity, you can absorb it into lambda. So you can write this expression as a convex combination of what are called deterministic functions. What are, yeah, those kind of like indica indicator. Yeah, given lambda, those are point masses. Exactly, exactly. So in that case, uh, well, I, didn't, I don't know why I erased it, but the variable, so for your a dot x equals b, this x are the weights yes, of, exactly. those, of those indications. Okay, okay. And then, yeah. And you get all the probability distributions such that, that Oh, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Um, all right. So 
Yes, we were here characterizing this, at least numerically, it's very hard. This is what, uh, this is the sort of problems we, are, we have kind of, or we are working towards solving within the quantum information community. Um, actually, I don't know, do uh, you think I can, I can extend for at least, uh, at least okay. 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as I, so I, I think for it, sure because we are like the end time is ah, 50. This is ah, okay, okay. Then then I can tell you a bit uh, a bit about it. All right. So yes, this is this is the um, the sort of problems that we are interested uh, within the quantum information community, and we have developed some tools. So essentially, the question is, in terms of like causal um, causal causal language would be numerically characterizing um, probability distributions compatible with, uh, so far, well, with, with complex graphs. Okay. And for that, um, we have developed a, a tool or, or a method that we call this graph. Yes? So complex graph in what sense? Uh, not easy at that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, okay, let, let, let me, let me, Okay, here I'm. I'm going to be. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you that. No, no. I'll be precise. So these are arbitrary dots. So I wanted to use complex graphs because typically, so the um, the technique is based on analyzing this sort of graphs that are kind of bipartite. Uh, but then it turns out that you can turn any DAG into one of this form. And I'll, I'll if I have time, I will, I will explain so a bit the, the way. This question is somehow funny because it's a reverse question that people do in classical causality. What they look is for the graph, which is explaining the probability distribution. So you are arguing that given a particular graph, what I'm trying to obtain is a probability distribution compatible with that graph. Yes. So, so the way the way is the opposite of what people is. Mm, yes, indeed. So this is this is not. I mean, th these tools will not be useful for causal discovery. But uh, things that we will be able to say is, I have this distribution, and I can know for sure that it was not generated in, in this graph. And uh, well, in, in the asymptotics, you will be able to say it can it can be generated in this graph, but that only asymptotically. Asymptotically in what? You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no. Yes. So the thing is that we do, I mean, this, because these problems are complicated, we do hierarchies of relaxations and each step in the relaxation is say more constraining, but you only have guarantees of achieving this full characterization in in the limit of infinity. But then this question has nothing to do with quantum mechanics in the sense. So you forgot already the motivation yeah. of this problem. Yes. So if I don't know anything about quantum mechanics, I still can play with this question. Yes, that, that's why I think uh, that's why I wanted to present it to, to you guys, because I think this has applicability way beyond uh, quantum mechanics. Um, Okay, so so this uh, now at least that I have time to put the references to the papers. Uh, <laughs> so a particularly successful technique or or framework that uh, people have been developing here is what it's called inflation, and it's actually so so it's essentially developed in this paper over here. Dot, uh, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, six, seven, two. And just like a, 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 a small comment uh, regarding if this has to do uh, with quantum or not. 
Actually, this paper is published in the Journal of Causal Inference. So uh, the people working on it, like the authors work in Quantum Info, but this is a JCI. <laughs> um, and then there's also this other one. Uh, seven, five, six, four, seven, six. Okay, and well, this in this one, it's where they sort of formally define this this hierarchy of relaxations, and they prove that in the limit you achieve the, the full characterization. And uh, the main idea of this. And, and what, uh, like, the, the, yeah, the main concept in, in the method is that if I know, if I knew, so, no, sorry, if a distribution had a realization on a given network, this is, this is if for a distribution, I knew what is this PR of lambda, this PR of sigma, and all these probabilities, I knew the, their expressions or how they are generated, then, at least theoretically, I could consider uh, thinking of what would happen if I had access to multiple copies of these distributions or, or of these realizations, and I started wiring them in more complicated scenarios. I'll, I'll show now in an example, but that is the main idea. Or, let's see. Uh, so the main idea is that if I have uh, a distribution that is compatible, then I, at least, at least in theory, I can consider having copies. Okay. And so what we do essentially is that uh, we consider uh, this, this imagined scenarios in which we have many copies of the elements in our causal graph, and uh, we trade all these factorization constraints by symmetries. I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a bit. So let's imagine uh, I'm going to come here now. So inflation. Uh, let's go back to to not the not the triangle, but the the other scenario. Imagine that we have. Uh, let's go back to this like by local scenario that it's called. Yeah, uh, now we have B, Y, and Z, C, and Z. We have our lambda. and uh, our sigma. Okay, so we're back in this scenario. And now uh, this, now we have, so let, let's think that, okay, this variable is uncharacterized, it's a latent variable, but let's assume that it's something, some classical system. So it's some property of a classical physical system, or it's, some, it's something classical. So something that uh, we know from quantum, well, we, a fact that we use a lot in quantum information theory is that the information encoded in a, in a quantum system cannot be cloned, but the information contained in a quantum in a classical system can be cloned. So if this were a car, an external observer could see what the car is and uh, send that information not to see, not just to see, but to also to a, another party that. Um, we're going to say it's a copy of C. So here, I mean, this I, I, I want. I think it's uh, important to have it clear because this is the core of the method. If we had a distribution that were compatible with this scenario, this means that we would know how to generate it. We would know what are these things and what are the distributions. We would know what these guys are doing for every value that they receive. If we know all that information, nothing prevents us from saying, okay, so if we have, uh, now that we have this information, what if 
we send it to another copy of this guy. And, the, and this copy does exactly the same thing as this guy does when they receive the same information. This is something that we can wonder, right? Why not? <laughs> okay. And now, well, now then let's try to characterize the distributions that are compatible with this new scenario. Or, or which, which kind of um, properties, com, pro, uh, distributions uh, that are compatible with this scenario satisfy. So we're going to have now a probability distribution of A, B, C, and C prime given X, Y, Z, and Z prime, right? And in particular, two things are interesting. First of all, when you swap C and C prime and Z and Z prime, so given that this part is a copy of this part and they receive the same information from sigma at every round, in, well, in this particular case, at every round, the distribution is invariant under this, this permutation. Uh, so this is a PR of A, B, C prime and C given X, Y, Z prime and Z. And uh, a second property is that when I forget about this new extra thing that I have added, whoops, then I'm looking at the original scenario. So if I had, uh, well, okay. So if uh, I sum over the values for this C prime of the PR, I'm not going to put all the indices again, then I would observe, let me call it the original distribution, A, B, C, X, Y, Z. Okay? Does this make sense? Like, because like th this is the core of the of the thing. Why is it the core? Because uh, now we can we can ask ourselves, well, what are the distributions PR of A, B, C, uh, C, C prime, given X, Y, Z? So, what are the distributions and Z prime? Correct. Thank you very much. So now, now we can wonder, does a distribution that satisfies these constraints exist? If we had, if our original distribution were compatible with the original scenario, so with this one over here, then we would be able to find a distribution in this new graph that satisfies these constraints. I mean, distributions in this graph satisfy many more constraints. For example, one, one that makes the problem, again, difficult is saying, okay, if I forget about B and I forget about one of the Cs, then I have factorization. But this, I don't want to take it into account now. What, I'm, what, uh, what we're doing is, if we had a distribution that were compatible with the original graph, then I would be able to find an, a distribution over four variables, like or, or, over four um, result variables that satisfy these two constraints. Um, and if I try to find one of these and I are able to prove that such distribution does not exist, then the premise that I used, namely that the original distribution was compatible, is not true. Okay, so what, what is the, the advantage here? That these constraints are linear. These constraints are linear, so finding an arbitrary probability distribution that satisfies these constraints is again a linear program. So we are back to having uh, efficient numerical tools for characterizing. But still, you could find some distribution for, for which those hold that is not compatible with the original. That is right. correct. Which that I is think. correct. It's, it's only one way. So we are. Uh, we are doing a relaxation of the problem. We are relaxing, finding like a complicated model by finding a dist. By, we are relaxing this by finding 
a distribution on an inflation. And then uh, a lot of what those papers do is saying, okay, uh, here I, I have considered a very simple, um, a very simple inflation, which can work or not. But in in, in in particular, it is possible that you there are incompatible distributions that are not detected by this inflation. I can consider many more inflations, and uh, well, it, it does it, does it make sense that I consider all possible inflations? If I consider all possible inflations, then then do I have a guarantee that um, that uh, the compatibility is is actually uh, strict? Well, these are the sort of questions that are answered in those papers, and uh, and in particular, there's I mean two things that I want to say is that um, yes, it's a complete curve. So first, there is a hierarchy uh, of inflations that people consider. So you can consider. Um, let me see how can I how I can explain this. Uh, yes, so there is a hierarchy for each uh, for each network. Well, no, I, I don't want to use network. Uh, so for each each causal graph that you want to consider, you can think of the hierarchy that arises when consider n copies of each latent variable. So for example, in this case of the of the um, of this by locality scenario, the second or level of the hierarchy is not as easy as this, but it's actually so you have one lambda, let, let me call it lambda one, another lambda, call it lambda two, and then a sigma one, and then a sigma two. And then we are the, the hierarchy considers as many copies of the visible nodes as determined from the latent nodes. So for example, in the original graph, you have that each A, so you have that A is influenced by lambda and X. So each copy that you consider in, the, in an inflation of A has to be influenced by A lambda and, 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 and X. So you're gonna have something like this and you're gonna have an A1 and an A2 that uh, are influenced by an X1 and then X2, uh, uh, the other way around. And uh, the same thing for the Cs, where I'm gonna have a C1 and a C2 that are influenced by an, a Z1 and then, sorry, a Z2 and a Z1. And then we have that in the original scenario, each bomb receives a lambda and a mu. So we're going to consider a different copy of Bob for each possible combination of lambdas and mu's. Uh, sorry, lambdas and sigmas. So eventually we're going to have four Bobs. And well, I'm going to do this a bit quickly, but it's something like this. Okay. So now if we want to consider, so instead of addressing the question of in the original scenario, we can ask, does there exist a probability distribution over A1, A2, B1, 1, B1, 2, B2, 1, B2, 2, C1, and C2, given all the things such that it has a lot of symmetries. It has, for example, the symmetry of, um, well, actually it's, it, it's a lot, but it's only two generators. That when I swap lambda one and lambda two, and when I swap sigma one and sigma two, they give rise to the same distribution. So these are the symmetries that I consider. These are the ones in section uh, of part one. And then that, for example, when I forget about these two central bobs, I have two independent realizations of the original scenario. So then I can, uh, I can uh, constrain also that. So if you keep growing this hierarchy longer and longer and longer, uh, that second paper uh, proves that uh, when n goes to infinity, you have uh, that, uh, so if you have, if you are able to find, 
sorry, if for each n, for every n, you can find a distribution in every inflation that is compatible with the constraint that you derive, then you know you have that a complete characterization. Or maybe like having admitting one of these models is equivalent to admitting any inflation for, for any level. Any finite level. Sounds very similar of uh, the Pinetti's theory. Yes, actually, uh, in order to prove this statement, they use uh, a version of, of the Finetti's theorem. Yeah, it, it's precisely that. And okay, I will, I will not extend, uh, I don't want to extend to more because uh, this, I mean, what this, uh, so I want to, I mean, there, there's a, a few more things to say, but uh, it's, it's already late. So I'll, I'll just uh, tell you that um, <clears throat> if you see all the, all the graphs that we have considered so far are, I said we would use arbitrary graphs, but so far we are dealing with kind of bipartite graphs. So we always have a layer of variables that are visible and have no children, and then a layer of either visible or latent variables that have no parents. Well, I just want to tell you that uh, uh, actually in, in the second paper over here, let me, let me go to it. In the second paper over here, they also explain uh, how you can turn more uh, general graphs into this sort of, of structure, actually using uh, tools that are very similar, but apparently not equivalent to this single world intervention graphs that were discussed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but essentially there's methods to turn any uh, causal graph into one of these bipartite forms. And then when we have one of these, we can characterize this, this, the correlations that are generated using this, these tools of inflation. And uh, I think that for today, this, this, this can be enough. But if you have any any more questions, I'm I'm happy to take them. <laughs>